Hi Sarah, how you doing? Good afternoon, Mary. <coughs> Hi Julie, well we've had a good day. Thanks for your message. Hi Charles. Yes, I'm all right, thanks, Sarah. I'm very good. I don't think this is a bit dark, actually. I'm not sure that um, I'm in the conservatory, but it's not as light as it should be. Anyway, hey, Sally. Right, so <clears throat> I'm going to start in a moment. Um, got a different mug tonight. This is one of the older mugs I've got. This is uh, my two cats here on this mug, which is a little bit of an odd thing to have, but Rachel bought me it. Uh, um, Tigger and Merlin. There we go. Merlin's over there asleep and figures out doing what cats do. Who knows where they go? We don't know. They disappear. Anyway, it's lovely to be with you all tonight. Um, stopped raining for a little bit, which is nice, so the conservatory's quiet. <clears throat> it's not on the roof. Not even not on the roof. Hi, Claire. Um, tonight, I'm going to pick up from where Luke was last speaking on Monday, two nights ago. And Luke spoke about the Ark of the Covenant and uh, God Dagon and the Philistines owning it and things like that. So tonight we're going to the next chapter, which is 1 Samuel 6. It's June the 3rd. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. And this is about the Ark returning back to Israel. So 1 Samuel 6. The Ark of, the, the Ark of God had been captured by the Philistines. So this is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Philistines were sort of the Israelite enemies throughout a lot of the Old Testament. You often hear about the Philistines, and uh, they, they really do come across as being sort of the bad guys. Um, now, <clears throat> they captured the Ayabat, they captured the Ark uh, from the Israelites. The Israelites took the Ark into battle, they, they, got, they got beaten. And, um, and then the Philistines had the Ark for not very long. My Bible says seven months, and, um, and it was a disaster for them. Everything went wrong. So they were determined to return the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. And this is, this is the story. It's in this chapter. Now, many of us have heard more about the Ark of the Covenant through films like Raiders of the Lost Ark and what have you. Um, I think probably if you're not a Christian, that's probably where you, where you, you would have heard of it from. Um, but to briefly explain what the Ark of the Covenant was, it was a, a big wooden box um, covered with gold and in the box was uh, the tablets that held the Ten Commandments and the top of the, 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 the box was uh, the mercy seat. The mercy seat which was where the priest would sprinkle blood on during the Passover to, to, as, a, as a blood sacrifice and, and God sort of dwelled within the, the mercy seat. Hi Luke. Hi Braden. So that's what the Ark of the Covenant was and that's what the Philistines wanted to get back to Israel because it was just a disaster for them. They had it for this for these seven months. Ultimately, it was nothing but trouble. Hi, Leah. Now, their approach in doing that to me seems a bit Mickey Mouse, to be honest. Because what they did was they put it on two sorry, they put it on a, a cart with two cows and they sent it towards Israel. And, and then it seemed all seemed a bit like odd because what they said was, well, if it goes one way down towards Beth Shemesh, which is where Israel was, then we'll know that we shouldn't have had it and that Israel should have it and then hopefully that will mean that we'll get rid of all these, these nastiness that's going on. We'll put some gold things on it, some, uh, mod, some, uh, some gold idols and things like that that we can give back as a guilt offering. But if it doesn't go that way and it goes to the left, then it means that all this bad stuff that's been happening is just by a chance and in actual fact we can keep it. So it was a bit odd, but that's what they did, you know. <clears throat> so, I'm going to pick it up. The story picks up from 1 Samuel 6, 13. And uh, this is what it says. The ark returned to Israel. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley. When they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. So this is the people of Israel. They've seen the ark coming towards them. And obviously they, they understand its significance. And they're very pleased. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, 
Shemesh. There it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. A bit of an unfortunate end for the cows, but that's how it worked in those days. The Levites, with the Levites were sort of the priests of the Israelite nation, the Levites took down the Ark of the Lord together with the chest containing the gold objects. These are the gold objects that the Philistines had put in as a guilt offering. And placed them also on the large rock. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and then returned that same day back to Ekron. So the Philistine, the Lord saw all this and then went back to, to Ekron to give their report, I can presume. <clears throat> Hi Dave. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is an extremely, or was an extremely powerful and holy item to the Israelites at that time. And the Israelites had had a special relationship with the Ark for, for many years. When, when Moses came down the mountain with the, ark, with, with the tablets of stone, with the Ten Commandments on, they, they, they created the Ark of the Covenant and put them inside it. And, and then it went with them. It was in front of the, the, the Israelite camp as they were going through the, uh, the desert. And then it was involved in all sorts of other things as well. And so this was of special significance to the Israelites. It, um, not only was it carried through the desert, it parted the waters of the Jordan. Uh, it was involved in several battles where it went in front of the, of the Israelites. It was at the Battle of Jericho, for example. In the Battle of Jericho where they went seven times around the wall uh, and then the walls fell down. Um, so it had huge significance. It carried the Ten Commandments, as I've mentioned. As I said, on top of it was the mercy seat, which was hugely important. Um, and it was kept within the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> Ultimately, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant ended up in the temple in Jerusalem, behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies during the time of Jesus. Now, it was one of the articles at the centre of the Old Covenant. Now, I mentioned the New Covenant today, but this was the, the sort of the centre of the Old Covenant. And, and it was sort of a physical item that the, the Israelites connected God with. Now, it seems to me, looking back through these stories about the Ark of the Covenant and its use and its importance to the, Philist to the Israelites, that it went from being a holy object that was understood as, as a connection with God to being something that was more of a good luck charm. That where the, the, the Israelites thought, well, you know what, we're not sure about this battle, but we'll take the Ark of the Covenant with us and that will protect us. So I think it became sort of a, dare I say, a lucky charm for the Israelites. And ultimately, I believe that was why the Philistines were able to capture it, because the Israelites had just lost its true meaning. Now, okay, I was looking back, it, looks, it seems a bit weird that the Israelites were like this way, but this is thousands of years ago. And all of this was in the Old Testament, and it was the, the way that God had set up um, initially to, to, to be in communion with his, with, his, with his people that were the Israelites. Now this morning, if you remember, I talked about justification by faith, which is under the New Covenant, the New Testament. And I explained that the New Covenant had replaced the Old Covenant, um, which is brilliant actually. Let's be honest, it's hugely important to us as Christians. And what it meant was that now our salvation can't be earned, it's a free gift. And our salvation is now not based around a, 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 um, a set of rules and regulations, it's based upon a free gift of salvation, which comes about through a faith in Jesus, who is our mediator. Not, not a priest, we, have, we don't have a human priest as a mediator, we have Jesus Christ. So, what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, God is not a lucky charm. Being in a relationship with God, being a Christian is a way of life. It is not a lucky charm. When the Israelites started seeing the ark as a lucky charm, it was a slippery slope. It was ultimately their downfall around this time. The item that the ark was, the ark, sorry, the item of the ark became important, not the relationship with God that was behind it. When the, Israel, well, sorry, when the Philistines captured the ark, they were thrilled, thinking it became their lucky charm. But of course, God didn't have a relationship with the Philistines. His relationship was with the Israelites. So he brought them nothing but trouble. Now I bring that to today, God is not a lucky charm. I think most Christians, I can, I'm definitely guilty of this, 
where we pray to God and we have a communion with God in different ways, in different seasons. And you know, when, we, when things are bad, when we're having a tough time, we, we cry out to God, perhaps we may even cry out to God more. But God is not a lucky charm. He's in relationship with us all year round, through the highs and through the lows. Whatever we're going through, he wants to be part of it with us. He doesn't just want to be someone that we call upon in a disaster when we, I don't know, have an illness or lose our job or have an accident or whatever. You know, God's there for those moments as well, but God wants a relationship with us every single minute, every single hour, every single day. And that's amazing. That's an incredible gift that we've been given by God of gods and Lord of lords. So God is not lucky charm. Secondly, God doesn't live in boxes. Now at this time, the, the, the ark was a box, for a better expression, that God, that God was part of. God was, God was, it was like quality physical presence there. But God lives in people, not boxes. God is not restricted to the ark. The ark was a relic of huge importance to the Israelites. It's a, it's a relic of huge historical importance. I mean, no one knows where it is now. If you believe the readers of the Lost Ark, it ended up in some warehouse somewhere, didn't it, at the end of it. But the fact of the matter is, it's just a box. No matter how important as a relic it is, it's just a box. God now lives inside us. And the reason we know that is because when Jesus died, now if you remember I said earlier on, the Ark of the, the, Ark of the Covenant ended up in the Holy of Holies in the temple. But when Jesus died, the, 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 the temple curtain was torn in two. And that exposed the Holy of Holies, and it exposed the Ark of God, and it exposed the mercy seat. So we no longer needed a priest to go and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat once a year, because we've got complete communion with God all year round. So that's it. That, that's it. Those, those, those two things are my thoughts on this chapter. God, first of all, is not a lucky charm, and God doesn't live in boxes, but lives inside us. Okay, that's me for tonight. Um, I wish you a lovely evening. It's stopped raining now, and um, and I will bid you good night. God bless.